Okay, we are good to go on our end. Okay, and can you make me a co-host? Yes. And can you promote, because she's from, presumably she's part of the um, presentation, can you promote Lisa? Yes. I'm assuming that she's going to be part, at least part of the presentation. Yeah, no, I'm, she she yeah. got a panelist invite, so, but okay, I'll, I'll fine. It just promote her. Okay. So good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. This is the uh, Parks and Public Spaces Committee meeting of Community Board 5. My name is Craig Slutskin. I'm the chairman of the, the chairperson of the committee. Uh, I'd like to, as I said, welcome everybody tonight. Uh, we have three items on the agenda, plus any new business. Uh, all three items are voting items. Uh, we will hear from the applicants. We'll hear from the committee member as well, if there was one. Uh, assigned to the uh, assignment, assigned to the application. Uh, we'll hear from the committee member, then we will uh, ask questions as a committee. We'll allow for public comments. And at that point, we'll go into business session. At that point, when we're in business session, it's only appropriate for members of the committee to speak uh, and deliberate unless uh, so otherwise deemed by the chair, me. Uh, we will then take a vote. Uh, that vote will not be the official position of CB5. That will be done at the formal meet, formal full board meeting of Community Board 5, which I believe is next Thursday. Uh, check cb5.org for, um, for more details. Um, and if there are any conflicts from the board member, from my committee members at any point, please uh, state before we start to deliberate, just so we are all aware. Uh, and I'll note that we do have a quorum so we can start meeting. So uh, we're going to start the meeting tonight with uh, the annual roster of events uh, for Madison Square Park. Uh, Stephanie is here tonight, and uh, we, my understanding is there's a lot of new events or a lot of com events coming back, and she's very excited to tell us all about them. So I will uh, turn it over to you, Stephanie. Thanks. Uh, yeah, there's quite a bit to share. Um, so uh, I'm going to cover all of our 2023 programming, and I'll also talk about um, our fundraisers that we'll have as well this year. Um, so if you have any specific questions regarding a program, if you could wait till the end of the presentation, and I will um, address those questions. There's quite a bit to go through. Um, so let's go ahead. Uh, so I'm going to start off with our community events. Um, these kind of defy our normal categories, um, and these are really events that are for specific demographics. Uh, so you'll see here, for example, uh, we have two dog related events, um, particularly around Mother's Day, Father's Day, which we call mm -hmm. Pup Parents Day on May 11th. We'll have a similar dog related event on October 13th called Halloween, which will be kind of a spooky festival. Um, and that's kind of, you know, we are celebrating essentially the conclusion of our renovation of the dog run last year and just um, kind of keeping up all the hype and excitement regarding the dog run and uh, our dog community uh, through these two particular events. Um, our biggest volunteer day of the year will be on November 12th and this will be Leaf Fest. Um, this is where people can come um, out to the park and volunteer raking some leaves and we'll chip those leaves and distribute them throughout the park. I do want to note here that this event is on a Sunday, and that is because uh, the Saturday of November 11th is Veterans Day in the park. So we had to change the date up a little bit. Um, holiday tree lighting will return on December 6th this year, and it will be our 100th and 11th anniversary of the first public Christmas tree in uh, North America. Now to our specific programming, um, we will have a uh, public programs related to the uh, recent installation by Shazia Sikander called Hava to Breathe Air and Life, uh, which has been getting a lot of press uh, in the, the different uh, medias. Uh, so we're really excited to have some accompanying programs to kind of talk a little bit about Hava's themes of women, nature, um, justice, and the, uh, you know, the advancement of women in different fields. Uh, we'll kick that off on February 6th with a panelist discussion called Lifting Women in Justice. Uh, and that will be with the artist Shazia Kander, Becca Heller, who is a very well-known lawyer, and Justice Judith Geish over at Sony Square. This will continue again on um, March 6th with a concert performance um, from uh, Aru Afjab. She's a Grammy Award-winning multi-instrumentist and also singer. 
Uh, we'll also continue the conversation of the art piece in the park through our reflection board. So we'll have a question posed to the public that over the course of one week from April 10th to the 17th, anyone can interact with it, leave their comments, um, thoughts and opinions regarding um, women in justice and uh, nature and justice and, and answering those particular uh, thought provoking questions. And then every single year we host an annual symposium regarding uh, our public art and this year's theme is transforming public art and uh, thanks to the SVA theater for letting us use that space on June 2nd. Again, we will continue with our lunchtime tours every Wednesday from now um, all the way through April. Uh, they're 15 minute tours between 12 and 1215. So if you haven't got a chance to look at the art yet, please come join us um, for a quick tour just to learn a little bit more about it. Um, and then we'll also have our art talks, which are these discussions with um, up and coming artists, established artists, and they'll discuss how their art um, and their practices relate to uh, the art pieces installed in the park. So very specifically relating it to the themes of Hava to breathe air and life. Uh, for our sustainability uh, public programming, we're continuing again with our self-guided uh, scavenger hunt. That information can be found online for our website. You can download a form and find out exactly what you would find in the park this season. We are also still recruiting volunteers to our Waste Warrior program. Uh, if you've been to any of our big public events um, or even our fundraisers, we always have a group of volunteers there encouraging people to um, compost and recycle. We don't like to have a fundraiser where things go straight to the landfill. So our waste volunteers volunteer at that particular event, um, educating people, helping us sort through those uh, particular items. Um, and then also reaching out to different businesses in the community of encouraging them to kind of adapt more uh, sustainable practices such as reducing single use plastics. Uh, every third Thursday, starting April, sorry, starting March 16th, we're gonna have wildlife tours in the park. Uh, so you can join us um, and a naturalist as we kind of explore the different animals, insects um, and other type of fungi and plants um, that are all in our very complex urban ecosystem located in the park, uh, all the way from peregrine falcons down to tiny little like wood bees. <laughs> so we're really excited about that program coming back. Uh, and we will continue to host uh, with Grow NYC a food scrap drop-off location um, near the Southern Fountain every Wednesday from 8 to 1 p.m. Uh, I am aware that there is some construction happening in the southern half of the park, but for the most part, the Grow NYC uh, compost booth will be roughly uh, near that area. I do have an exciting announcement regarding our green dining destination partnership. Uh, so the green dining destination, um, the green dining destination project is a uh, collaboration between the Conservancy Flatter Nomad Partnership um, and Green Dining Association, and that's getting restaurants signed up to engage in accredited practices that you know reduce single waste, um, engage in composting, just looking at ways we can make the restaurant industry, which has a very high amount of of waste output and making it greener. Uh, and I'm happy to announce as of early January, we've had seven restaurants sign on, uh, four are in the process of accreditation, and uh, we just need nine more to become the first uh, real big uh, greenest dining destination in America. So we're, half, we're more than halfway there. Uh, for our other sustainability programs, we are going to host a webinar series on June 8th and October 31st, focusing on birds, bees, and bats. Uh, so that's something if you can't join us in the park, you can learn more about the different animals. And when I say bats, I'm not joking. We do have bats here in the park um, that call the park home. I'm very excited to announce our Waste Expo. This is probably my favorite program of the year. It'll be hosted on April 15th. And the Conservancy and several other organizations, um, so that would include, for example, Sims Recycling, which handles New York City's recycling system. We'll also have Stop and Swap uh, participate, uh, Deliver Zero and Redish, and they're going to host kind of these little info tables about um, how you kind of can achieve your zero waste goals. There'll be fun activities, games, um, 
and hopefully not so many giveaways to be uh, mindful of what we consume, um, except for the stop and swap stuff. Um, and that particular component of the event encourages anyone from New York City to come to that event, drop off things that you may have in your house, um, and anyone can come and just take those items for free. So just finding um, a new home for items that we no longer need in our own homes. Uh, we'll also participate again this year in the City Nature Challenge. It is a weekend event um, throughout the world where anyone can come um, with you know, a small little uh, smartphone or an app um, and take some collective, uh, they can collect some observations about the different um, animals and plants that they see in their park. So we're excited to be participating in that. Um, and that helps better inform research regarding um, the health of our ecosystems. If there are any alarming trends regarding climate change, that's where all that data is going to be used for. To continue that into July, uh, we will be hosting a plastic pop-up um, in relation to our Plastic Free July campaign. Um, so we'll have some games and activities for all ages regarding recycling. Firefly Watch Party returns on July 27th. Um, we'll have extended lawn hours and we'll be encouraging people to learn about the fireflies um, from a distance uh, so that they can, you know, continue their search um, for their partners um, during the summer before they go uh, back into dormancy. And then we'll also host a solar pop-up on August 3rd and that's encouraging people to um, support renewable energy uh, initiatives to sign up to uh, make green energy more uh, cost effective for all New Yorkers. Um, that's the best way that we can kind of encourage uh, renewable energy in the park. For our horticultural programs, we'll be hosting um, some beautiful garden displays featuring flowers um, in the spring and also in the summer, and it will be themed towards mathematical concepts and geometry. So we'll be exploring things like the golden ratio, um, the Fibonacci sequence, and uh, our yarn embeds will be blooming in these beautiful ornate designs. And we are partnering with a couple of different local partners to host uh, kind of kid-friendly activities related to math and nature in the park in March and April. We already have started our Zoom series, um, which is our uh, bot botanical book club. We've been reading Urban Forests by Jill Jones, uh, and we'll continue that discussion on February 1st and February 8th um, online. So please join us for that at 6 p.m. and 7, uh, through 7 p.m. I'm almost there, guys. <laughs> so on February 23rd, we will be hosting a seed swap uh, over at Sony Square. Uh, we've had some nurseries donate some seeds that anyone can come pick up some seeds and you can sow them in your garden. On the second Tuesday of every month, starting in March, um, our gardeners will host tours of the park so you can discover what's in bloom. Letters for the Trees uh, returns on April 21st and Anyone can enjoy the, the trees and the canopy in the park that provides us with so much shade, so much love, and kind of reciprocate that by dropping off a love letter in any of the mailboxes that we'll have scattered throughout. National Gardens Week is a week-long campaign as part of a, uh, the American Public Gardens Association, and we'll be participating in that. Uh, activities are still TBD, but expect that in May. We will also be hosting a forest bathing session. So if you're not familiar with the term forest bathing, um, it has been scientifically proven that um, going out into nature and kind of immersing yourself um, in that particular environment is actually very meditative and healing. So we'll be hosting um, a very exciting event on, a, or maybe a very relaxing event on May 18th. And then Garden Pride, which is where we uh, spray paint all the alliums in the flags of the LGBT community. That'll be leading up to Pride in this uh, particular uh, June. Now to our fundraisers, we'll be hosting our annual gala on March 28th um, from uh, five to about 8 p.m. at night. This particular gala is uh, themed towards uh, the real estate community and city planning. We'll be honoring Leslie Spira Lopez, who is on Madison Square Park's board um, and is also the president and CEO of Q Management. And we'll also be honoring Daniel Gorodnik, who is the chair of the City Planning Commission and director of New York City's 
Department of City Planning. So tickets are available online for that particular event. It is our largest fundraiser of the year um, and does help us pay for all those free public programs. Our second fundraiser for the year will be a brand new event. Um, and I know some of you on the committee who I already see Mike shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> It is not the Big Apple barbecue of yore. Uh, this is not a three-day festival where we will have, you know, uh, barbecue smoke uh, for three days and everything smells like meat. This will be a one night of event on Tuesday, uh, June 13th from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. It will be in the style of Celebrate or Taste of Asia. So if you're familiar with those events, um, we invite uh, 30 restaurants to come um, and sample some food. People can buy a ticket, that ticket goes to support the park, um, and we will keep grilling to a minimum, I promise. <laughs> and then lastly, uh, we expect Taste of Asia to return, most likely in October. Uh, this is our second food fundraising event, um, and it is in its third year um, of creation. This in, uh, has about 40 restaurants attached to it, um, and it is kind of curated by Simon Kim, the restaurateur, and they will be sharing kind of Asian inspired bites. Um, and this is actually our second biggest fundraiser. It benefits Madison Square Park and two additional nonprofit partners. So that will be coming back um, most likely this year. So I'm happy to take any questions now. I know that was quite a lot to process. And you save the best for last. <laughs> of course, it's my favorite event. Um. So uh, before I let my uh, esteemed colleagues ask questions, I have, I have a couple and not surprisingly, it's about the Big Apple Barbecue return. Yeah. Is, I know it's abbreviated. So can you talk to us more about that? And, you know, is it, are you closing the whole park like you used to? Uh, how much, how much in loss in terms of days before, days after, do we sure. lose? Because I know this is, this is a Tuesday night. It's not a Saturday and a Sunday. Like it's, it's, it's not the whole weekend. Like I, I get yeah, it and it's going to actually be a smaller setup than Taste of Asia. So Taste of Asia actually has um, a larger tent setup to it. Um, we will be tenting specifically thirty restaurants and probably um, a couple of different activations. This won't be the entire park or the entire surrounding part of the park. Um, it will most likely be confined to the lawn area um, and the gravel area. So. Anything kind of where the reflecting pool in North is will still be accessible to the public. Um, and just for like the, the days where we're loading in those tents, um, so probably two days before the night of, and then the tents will be gone by the fourth day, the end of the fourth day. Um, what was the motivation to bring this back? I mean, we fought for many yeah. years. Quite frankly, I've been on the committee for, I don't know, 10 years or something like that maybe more, and, and you know, they were fighting this before I was on the committee. And yeah, so, so let me talk, yeah, let me talk a little bit about for, because I know there's some faces here who are new to uh, sure. CB5 as of um, last year. So Big Apple Barbecue used to be this big three, I, I wanna say three day celebration, but including right. load in and load out, it was really five days, um, where we would invite restaurant, we would invite pit masters from all over the United States and they would bring their smokers and their grills and they would set it up all along Madison Avenue and 26th Street. And it would just generate a ton of smoke and smells um, that anyone in New York City could come and buy a plate for, you know, $11, $12. Um, that particular model was not really financially great for the conservancy because of all the cost of flying in all these people um, and cutting it with um, the different event organizers and things like that. Um, so we are straying away from that model of bringing these giant pit masters um, and these giant smokers and everything like that. Most of the food will be cooked off site um, and brought here and heated up um, generally on electric stoves or things like that. Um, we will probably have one or two small grills. And when I mean small grills, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the things that you would find in your backyard. <laughs> None of those giant pit smokers um, that we used to have in the past. And this will all be confined into the interior of the park. They'll probably start cooking around 1 p.m. And then, you know, they'll shut off or they'll run out of food generally by, you know, 7.30, 8 p.m. when the event ends. Um, so it is a much shorter time frame. A lot of the smoke is going to be eliminated um, and it's really in the style of a fundraiser because we are in a massive deficit this particular year. Um, we are uh, essentially looking to, uh, we are $1 million short of the funds that we need um, 
to kind of assume normal operating costs. So this particular fundraiser, we're capitalizing on the Big Apple Barbecue name, but it's not Big Apple Barbecue in the format that it used to be. Do you envision music and or loud music? And then back uh, there will probably be a small band similar to kind of like Taste of Asia or Celebrate. It won't be like a giant stage or anything like that. Again, much Big Apple Barbecue scaled down to kind of a small Celebrate style type fundraiser like Taste of Asia. Um, I'm going to let my uh, esteemed colleagues ask some questions now. Uh, Mike. Oh, I'm not on you. Good. Uh, you can hear me. Um, so um, in the past, some of my favorite events, um, I was wondering if there's any thought about repeating the Halloween event where the park gave out, hollow, um, what do you call those orange things with the top on them with the pumpkins? Oh, the pumpkins, yeah. And they, and they gave out the uh, stickers for the eyes and the mouth and the nose and, the, and all of that stuff. That was a, I brought my grandkids to that. They loved it. Number one. Last year, you had a Dia de Morte. That was fantastic. Um, I went to that one also. And I was wondering about those two, if there's any thoughts about repeating them or desire to repeat them. And while you're doing that, could you put up the last slide that showed a picture from the top of Madison's, uh, of the park, so I could take a picture of it with my camera? I can sh also share a photo of the, the aerial photo with you, Mike. Um in an email uh, to speak to the Halloween event. Um, so we haven't done the pumpkin festival in a very long time. It eventually morphed into Kids Fest, um, which was a big performance art festival in the fall. Um, unfortunately, we do not have the funds um, to kind of create those style events anymore. Um, it's just not feasible in the current financial economic climate that we're in. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's one of those casualties. Um, in regards to the, uh, the Day of the Dead event on the Flatiron Plaza, I can't take credit for it. That is the brain work of the fantastic team over at the Flatiron Nomad Partnership. Um, so kudos to Claudia over there for hosting that event. It was fantastic. Um, and uh, it was great as well. <laughs> I loved it. Um, okay, thanks for the slide. Uh, Aaron. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for that great presentation. Um, so you, you talk about the Big Apple barbecue, but it won't be the quite Big, big Apple barbecue. I, I would strongly suggest that you call it something else because that name has such a stigma and negative reaction in the, in the neighborhood that like in your marketing, I understand you want to like, that's the best way to explain what it is, but I would really suggest that you approach that naming and marketing in a very different way so that it doesn't you know, sound to the neighborhood that it's coming back. I, I don't know how you do that, yeah. but I just wanted to. We've had it. a lot of discussions. Um, we were actually thinking about the name for uh, since, I want to say September. Um, and it was one of those things where um, one, um, obviously, yes, uh, Big Apple Barbecue has a, a somewhat negative connotation within the community. But at the same time, um, outside of the community in, in the wider New York City area, it does have a very positive connotation with people who have attended the event. And it's it's been a tricky balance of, of handling how we talk about uh, celebrate Big Apple Barbecue. And so I think we'll do our best to be as transparent as possible through our communications and messaging going forward. But the brand has such a, a, a strong positive uh, symbol, um, symbolism with the greater New York City area. And, and we really do need to capture, unfortunately, those ticket sales um, to really fund all of our programs and our operating costs here at Madison Square Park. So it, it was a very hard decision on our part. Um, and that's why we kind of hybrided it with Celebrate, which uh, Flatiron Chefs. So we're hoping by combining that Celebrate style event with Big Apple Barbecue and then communicating our messaging around how the event is going to be run um, it will be a little bit more accepted by the community. And again, we'll take any feedback that we have uh, post-event this June, um, and hopefully that will change hearts and minds. Stephanie, didn't somebody, I mean, Big Apple Barbecue was a brand. Does, doesn't somebody own that name? Like, and they, they moved it, right? They moved it and it, they moved so, it somewhere. 
so, so doesn't some isn't that trademarked or, or owned or something like that? Yeah, so it was always owned by near uh, by the Conservancy. Okay, um, but we had contracted that event out to a different event okay. producer. Yeah, so it was always put on by an event producer, but it's always been owned by the Conservancy. I mean, so, so to Aaron's point, maybe you keep the name, you know, Big Apple Barbecue, but you call it the all new yeah. Big Apple Barbecue or, you know, I'm not, an, I'm not a marketing person, but like the rebranded Big Apple Barbecue or the, you know, less annoying Big yeah. Apple Barbecue or, or something I, like that. I will have this conversation throughout the year. I guarantee it. I'm going to get a lot of emails about yeah. it and I'm going to do my best to communicate that it is not the old school Big Apple Barbecue of your, I promise. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, to me, and I, I want to get to the public and allow them to 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 to, to uh, mm -hmm. weigh in as well. But the fact that it's more local, I mean, I saw some of the businesses you you had the slide up Hill Country, you know, that's more local. I think is is a positive to me, and that the food is going to be cooked mostly offsite. Yeah. Um, before I go to the public, uh, is there anybody else from the committee? Aiden, you want to say something? Add, add something? Yeah. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the park budget looks to be in deficit. Can you just, out of curiosity, what's driving that? Are people pulling back corporate sponsorships or um, like just that's out of curiosity. But then second part of the question is, those are, are any of these programming events that you just outlined at risk? If you guys don't um, like okay. me, rectify that deficit or, yeah. or how, are you, how are you guys kind of thinking about that? Everything that is being presented here is going to um, happen in some form. Uh, we're very fortunate to have um, a lot of partners um, such as Sony, um, who's been able to donate space for our winter programs and things like that. Um, we're very fortunate that we have been able to fund all the public programs presented here tonight. Um, where we are in terms of deficit, um, obviously we're dealing with a lot of the inflationary uh, concerns that uh, hit everybody. Uh, we have concerns about making sure that we're able to hold the uh, cost of living for our employees in particular and making sure we're able to retain amazing talent um, that bring these programmings and these projects to life. Um, so we are having that in mind as well. Uh, we have lost a lot of kind of corporate sponsors and some kind of funding from our higher level donors as people moved out during the particular pandemic um, that we had. And um, it's just a lot of challenges in different areas. Um, we've also experienced a drop off in revenue due to the construction that's been happening in the park. So if you've walked through the park in the last six months, you know, we've had um, major closeway, uh, closures to our pathways as we kind of repave and electrify the Southern end of the park. Uh, that unfortunately has also eaten into our marketing activation revenue, which is why you probably all really like me because I haven't had to present on that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it has unfortunately uh, dropped off revenue in that particular performance. We don't hold uh, a lot of film shoots currently because of the construction in the park. Um, so it, it does, the, the current situation um, in the park is, is something that we're very concerned about. We've already taken cost cutting measures, but not at the expense of um, the quality of programs or the quality of people we employ. And just for the uh, newer members, I think we've spoken about this, but just as a reminder, the park doesn't get any money from the city. It's, it's all privately financed. So they, they use these events uh, to, to partially fund. They obviously also get a significant amount of donations, contributions from the, from the public. Um, the Conservancy is also allowed by contract for marketing events, uh, which uh, they sometimes have two, sometimes they have three, but it's up to four marketing events a year where they also raise a significant amount of money. Stephanie, do you have any visibility on, on marketing events this year? I yeah. Know, I it's still early, but do you have any sense as to anything down the pipe? Uh, when we do marketing events because of the construction of the park, and, and I'm very intimately aware with them because that's sure. my department, um, we are having trouble filling the marketing slots that we, all four of them, because we have limited availability. Um, once the construction out of the park, um, after June, I think we'll probably start seeing more interest in hosting a marketing event in New York City where you can see your brand not next to a construction fence. <laughs> um, 
but again, we're limited on time because we also do have a fundraiser. We do have um, our installations. We do have programming. So we have a very limited schedule where we can host those marketing events in Madison Square Park in the second half of the year. Um, so I do expect not to fill necessarily all four of those slots, but hopefully we'll find one or two brands that are willing to um, donate a good amount of money in exchange for promotion. And remind me, how many did you have last year? Three or two? We had three, um, okay. and the third one was kind of hard to get. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mike, you have another question or comment? Yeah. Um, did you just say after June, you anticipating that uh, work to be done? So uh, the June, uh, June is, let me phrase it this way. The construction company has to finish their project by June or they'll face a lot of kind of um, fees regarding going over uh, their scheduled time. And one more thing, um, Craig, I, I believe I asked this in the past uh, that 100% of the funding for the park comes from uh, fundraising events and contributions and such. But I was corrected, as I recall, I don't have the greatest, the greatest memory, uh, that it's not 100%. Am I right? Certain monies do come from the city and the state? So money does come from the city in terms of our capital projects. So when we do major infrastructure projects like repaving, um, half of it is uh, a good portion of it is raised by the city. But in terms of that general operating costs, um, so keeping the park clean every single day, um, the security uh, the security staff on site for the park, we actually all pay for that um, through our corporate donations. So 100% of the funds that we raise goes to that. The only time we receive kind of city or state money um, is really through those capital projects, which are infrastructure related. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Is it, your hand is still up. Are you have another question or Mike? Your hand is still up. Okay. I'll lower it. Um, there might be a situation, actually, Stephanie, where you want them to be delayed because you'll make money off of that. <laughs> I think it goes straight to the city. I don't think it oh, goes oh, to us. <laughs> and we can't sabotage. Um, yeah. uh, anybody from the public? Uh, I know we have uh, several, uh, two people. Uh, Charles, uh, I am going to allow you to talk. Mute. You, should, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Welcome to the meeting, Charles. It's good to hear from you. Thank you very much. Um, my public comment is, um, as a person with disability, I just want to say um, just a thank you so much to the um, Conservancy staff who helped me last year with the holiday tree lighting. Um, your staff, Stephanie, looked after me so well and I had such a great time listening to the Christmas carols and enjoying myself. Um, so just thank you for um, helping me and I look forward to being being assisted to future uh, events. So thank you very much. Of course, I'm going to pass it along to Truth who was with you that day. So I'll, I'll pass thank on your thanks. Thank you. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Um, anyone else? Any other comments from the members of the public? Uh, any further questions or comments uh, from the committee? Kim. Hey there. I just wanted to chime in as a fellow nonprofit leader. I feel your pain with trying to close deficits and uh, appreciate kind of your candor with us regarding that and the transparency required. I, I think just to like further contextualize for the rest of my fellow committee members, obviously we saw a decline in both foundation and individual assets of about 20% last year. So that's had a significant impact on giving for nonprofits. So I think we should definitely take that into account and, um, I'm excited for everything that is coming ahead. So thanks so much for your presentation today. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, and, and like I mentioned before, you know, everything will be that's been presented will be funded. Um, we will always keep in mind um, kind of our public use and, and how people use the park when we ever vet marketing events and things like that. We're not just going to sell ourselves in order to get some funds. Um, we'll always keep in mind our core principles as we go forward. Um, but we appreciate kind of uh, the support the community has given us, and we're looking forward to making new contacts with other businesses that are moving in and, and hopefully getting ourselves um, into a better financial state. 
Thanks. Uh, any other comments? Does someone want to then make a motion? Motion to approve. Second. And one second. Second. Okay, let's take it to a vote. Me again. Hello, okay. hello. <laughs> Sorry, team. Okay. Slutskin. Yes. McCall, yes. Achilles? Yes. Berman? Yes. Blake? Yes. Ellington? Yes. Ford? Yes. Yes. Harris? Yes. Kayback? Yes. Kang? Yes. Shapiro? Yes. Spandorf? Yes. Spence? Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, we look forward to all these events. It's nice that a lot of them are coming back uh, or expand being expanded. So uh, we look forward to uh, seeing all these events and uh, hearing more from you throughout, throughout the year. Okay. Thank you guys for having me on tonight. Enjoy okay. the rest of your evening. Have a good night. So uh, the next item uh, is going to be uh, the FIT amendments to design elements for exterior pavers uh, to, a new, to the entrance of the new academic building. I think uh, Lisa is on. Are you on, Lisa? Hey, everyone. This is Matt Kevlin from Shop Architects. I see Lisa as an attendee, but I don't know if she was able to get onto the panelists. I'm promoting her before. Let me try it again. Right. Lisa's been promoted, so... Oh, okay. She she was on twice, so oh, okay. Um, she should she should be there. Okay. So either way, uh, Matthew, probably you can. I'm guessing that you. Oh, there we go. There, Lisa. Um, Lisa, can you? Indeed, I can. How are you? It's good to see you at a uh, non full board meeting. I always see you at the full board meeting. Yes, so. this is my Hello. office. Usually, I'm. <laughs> dialing in from home um so hello um you know as i i think you all know me from the full board meetings but for the public and because this is a recorded uh document i'm lisa wager director of government community relations at the fashion institute of technology the suny college on 27th between 7th and 8th um, we're here tonight to present some modest changes to an exterior area of the new academic building that FIT is constructing on 28th Street within the footprint of our campus. So that block, we have the full block from 27th to 28th, from 7th to 8th. Our team here, uh, some of whom have been promoted, and oh, I see everybody actually is promoted, that's terrific, includes uh, Sherry Brabham, who's FIT's Vice President of Finance and Administration, Phillips McCarty, who is FIT's Vice President for Advancement and also the Executive Director of the FIT Foundation. Alan King, who's uh, the Associate Executive Director for Facilities and Construction Management. June Eng, who's the FIT Director of Space Planning and Management. And also Matt Kippelman, who's the Project Director at Shop Architects, the firm which designed the building. And Emily Gordon, Senior Landscape Architect of Matthews Nielsen Landscape Architects, which designed the donor walk that we're here to present. So a number of you, in fact, almost all of you, perhaps in fact, all of you, <laughs> except Vicki, um, have joined Community Board 5 since this building was initially presented in 2009 because it took quite a while to raise the city's share of the capital funding for the project. Just to note, although I do mention this at every full board meeting, FIT is a SUNY public college, and as such, the vast majority of our capital funding comes from the state and the city. Most relevantly to this meeting, all of our academic buildings are on city-owned property, which means that any exterior changes must be approved by the New York City Public Design Commission. You probably know that part of the application for the Design Commission review is a resolution or letter from the relevant community board. So we are here to seek your recommendation and check the community board box on the PDC application form. 
So just as brief background and orientation, this is the first new academic building that FIT has built in over 40 years. Our student population has way more than doubled our space, not at all. It's 10 stories tall. It will achieve LEED gold status. It is, as I said, fully within the footprint of the campus, and it got unanimous approval from Community Board 5 back in 2009. The building topped out this fall and it is now fully, nearly fully enclosed by its glass and fin facade, which by the way, I've actually had unsolicited compliments on from neighbors who live on the block. Uh, we expect completion and fit out in fall of 2023 and occupancy by 2024. So we've brought this before the PDC a Public Design Commission for review and approval on four occasions, conceptual and preliminary design, which were both in 2016, final design in 2017, and final revised design in 2019. In early 2019, we'd finally raised the funding for the design, only to find out that construction costs had outstripped the funds in hand and the building needed value engineering with a revised design to work with the available funding. And we did that and in October 2019, CB5 provided another resolution and a letter for the November 2019 PDC application, which was immediately followed by the holidays and the arrival of COVID. But we persisted. And now we've topped out and we're looking at occupancy in 2024. Um, I spoke with the PDC Director of Capital Projects, and once she recognized that this application was not, in fact, about a distinctive sidewalk, which is, as you know, a whole other kettle of fish, she said it would be considered as an abbreviated revised submission, so that's why we're here today. The changes we'll be presenting are to two elements, a different stone for the pavers, as close as we could get to the original one in light of supply chain issues, and now those pavers, which span the front, the length of the front of the building, will be engraved with donor names. Everything else in the renderings represents elements that have been approved since 2019 or much earlier. So let's start, Matt, if you could share your screen and put up the slides. Let's go through the preliminary slides. And I'm then I'm going to hand the presentation over to Emily Gordon, who's a senior architect at MNLA, as I said. Okay, so this is what it's going to look like. It looks getting close to that now. Next slide, please. Sorry, one second. There we go. Okay, this is where it is. The light blue is the campus. The dark blue is the building. Next slide. Here's a close up. Light blue is the our, our FIT buildings. The dark blue is where the new academic building is going. And by the way, it went on an empty lot that was used for storage and garbage. It's a terrific improvement to the block. Next slide, please. Oh, I thought we had a facade one in here. So um, we were going to have a facade, but I'm. Oh, oh, here we go. Excuse me. So. Oh, you can go back. So go back one. So that's what it looks. No, to the next one. There we go. That's what it looks like from the uh, corner of 7th and uh, 28th. And then the next slide is the facade, at which point I'm now handing it over to Emily Gordon, who can speak about this wonderful uh, project. Thank you, Emily. Hi, all. Thank you for having us. Um, so this view is taken from the street level at 28th Street, looking at the public entrance to the building. So what you see here kind of in the foreground is the public right of way, the DOT sidewalk, um, which is not the area we're discussing today. And then inset under sort of the overhang of the building is the walk that we'll be discussing today that will receive the donor names engraved on the pavers there within um, the boundary of the building footprint. Um, and just to sort of touch on the, the overall concept for this public entrance that is illustrated here, it was really about creating sort of this public mixing zone between the campus and the broader community and creating some transparent moments between the programs happening indoors um, and what the public gets to see and creating sort of this, this shared mixing zone, which we think the donor names really contributes to that overall goal of the design. Next. So just to review the, the kind of fixed elements that are not changing um, from the previous design, 
Um, out again, out on the DOT, the public sidewalk, the only intervention there is the addition of nine honey locust street trees that are being planted as part of this project. The rest of the details and materials on that public sidewalk are following the DOT standard. And then inside um, that space that's underneath the overhang is where we have the public entrance to the building. The, the vestibule has entries on both the east and west side, so the building can be approached and entered from either direction. The majority of sort of the length of that is flush to the public sidewalk, so it really feels like this one shared zone. And then as you get closer to the doorways where you kind of see that triangular symbol on the plan, the walk ramps up just um, a couple of feet to get you up to the elevation of the first floor. And then on the east side of the walk, um, we have also some, some public seating incorporated into the design in the form of a couple of benches, which again, those have been there um, previously as well. Next. Much to Layla's delight, I will say, Ed. <laughs> um, so zooming in, you can kind of start to see the names showing up here. They're still very faint and we will get into um, an even closer look at the engraving itself, but this is just to kind of orient you to the concept of how these names will be laid out on the pavers. Um, in this phase of design, we did not want to mess with the paver sizes or the paver layouts that were already part of the design. So this is just adding that element of engraving on top. Um, and the concept here really relied on three primary design goals. The first being that the engraved text should create a unified expression of the FIT community as a whole, rather than draw attention to like one or two big donor names. So our layout aims to create more of a textured field of continuously flowing names that works with the staggered repeat of the pavers themselves. The second element or design goal for the layout came from looking at the textile work of FIT students and in particular looking at different patterns that can be extrapolated out of the weaving studios and the fabric work. So we conceptualize the text and the pavers as working together together to create this kind of unified woven field. And then thirdly, the layout of the names had to be flexible and fluid so that it could work with the paver sizes and the layout that was already established and to navigate easily around other fixed elements, such as the building columns that you see touching down in the plan or the benches or sort of other irregularities um, in this space. So if you flip, we can zoom in even closer to how these names are laid out. There is a repeating logic to the layout. So this is sort of looking at one module of that pattern that get, that creates the framework that gets repeated across the length. We have three different paver sizes. The largest two sizes will receive names and they're laid out just in this sort of fluid alignment um, that can move back and forth throughout the space. The um, font style itself for the names includes three different font styles that indicate different levels of donor giving. Um, so you can see those diagrammed out there. And the family of fonts um, and font styles is consistent with kind of the overall FIT um, signage and wayfinding style. Um, in terms of sort of exactly what the text will say, the examples you see there is all clearly placeholder text. Um, the donor campaigns have not happened yet. So as the donor campaigns happen, um, the specific names and submissions will be laid out. Um, there is sort of ongoing discussion about how, how those submissions will be standardized and it's currently going to be approached that it will include names only, although in some um, there may also be some additional options for standardized messaging, such as um, a consistent in memory of or class of or in honor of, but those would be limited options. So there's going to be an explicit naming convention that all the engraving will follow. And as, as Emily said, it's only names except in the occasional uh, things that she just listed. And then in terms of the, the installation and how this will be phased in over time, 
Um, the intent here is that the donor campaigns might happen in several phases. And so it was really important to us to come up with a strategy for installing this over time that did not result in the walk ever looking um, mistakenly incomplete at any given moment. So the strategy we've come up with is two primary phases of installation. The first phase kind of completes the entire walk, but at a 50% density, um, sort of embracing that, that irregular weaving pattern. And then the second phase would go in and fill in the remaining density. Um, those two primary phases can then be subdivided into smaller zones, which will just help with sequencing um, the order of installation. So the stones themselves are all going in as part of the initial building construction, and the engraving happens on site at a later time, um, sequenced with the, the fundraising campaigns. And then this is just a, a closer look at what those two different phases of density would look like over sort of a run of pavers. So you can see the image on the left has that 50% initial density, and then the image on the right is the completed density. And then lastly, we have um, images of the materials palette, and this um, notes sort of that first change that was mentioned that had to do with the supply issue related to the first stone that was selected. Um, it was a very specific um, type of gray granite that came from one very specific quarry. Um, needless to say, it has been difficult to obtain that stone. And so um, we worked with suppliers to propose an alternate that is in the same range of sort of a mid gray color, um, but is a, similarly a granite and has sort of all the same performance and durability um, elements as the first stone we selected. And then on the far right of this image, you can see um, those are photos of the, the actual stone engraving samples that we have. So the lettering there is a very shallow engraving. It's um, done through a sandblasting process. The depth of the letters is only about an eighth of an inch deep. Um, so it's compliant with all you know, universal ADA um, requirements. And then the letters will receive this black um, infill in order to make them legible. And the final image here is just our, our planting palette, which again, is really just um, the nine honey locust street trees that will be planted as part of the project. Okay, so are there questions from the committee? Are there any questions? I guess before we go on to questions, John, this was, this was uh, you, you reviewed this. Do you, and, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, and if you don't, you don't, but do you have any comments or uh, questions that you want to bring up? I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess, uh, first of all, maybe some members would just be curious why this is before um, uh, parks and public spaces. In, in, in theory, it could it, the, the original applications uh, were before um, the, uh, the the name of the committee has changed from time to time, but the committee to handle the zoning. Um, uh, so currently, this would be Layla's committee. Uh, but uh, a general conclusion uh, decision was made uh, uh, by the leadership of um, of the of the board uh, that. Uh, that that the ju proper jurisdiction should be um, our committee, primarily because this is a sidewalk of all practical purposes. Um, I, I did have a conversation uh, with, with Lisa, and I would like to say, in my opinion, uh, let's talk about the two elements of this, of this uh, application. The first involving uh, uh, the change in granite. I believe that the change in the actual uh, type of granite, as well as the color and the tone, are not material changes. I consider those to be immaterial. So, uh, at least in my judgment, I think that's a, a non-issue. Uh, with respect to the second element of the project, um, uh, again, um, I, I'm I'm personally comfortable with it. I think I I do have a few questions about naming convention, uh, which I will. I'll proceed to ask and whoever wants to respond, I would appreciate that. Um, first question is, uh, uh, 
uh, you mentioned only names would go. Uh, does that uh, exclude corporations? Or could you envision a, a situation where corporations would be uh, would also be uh, honored, acknowledged? Um, the person to answer that is our Vice President Phillips McCarty, and he's been frozen for about five minutes. So I'm going to just call him on the phone. Oh, Phil, can you hear me? You're smiling. I can hear you fine. I don't know if I'm frozen on the screen. You're president. You're president. We can hear you. Great. Yeah. Perfect yeah, timing. I'm here. <laughs> um, I'm here. Um, the the answer to that would be that we would we would allow corporate owners to have their name on the walkway. Um, that that being said, we um, we also, as I think all of you know, are very um, conscientious of the corporate partners who we do have um, at FIT. So we have certain criteria in place in terms of sponsors, partners, and what have you. That would all be applied here, and of course, uh, we would we would be very respectful of what types of partners we look at that <clears throat> that may be um, a part of the walkway. We really think that the majority of the people on the walkway will be individuals. That's that's what most of these walkways or paper campaigns um, really are, are appealing for individuals more so than corporations. Um, but but we would look at corporate donors as well. OK, and then a follow up question. Uh, uh, would it would you permit uh, the use of trademarks? or other insignia other than the actual name of the corporation uh, to be part of uh, the engrave engraving? Well, we said names only. Right, so, I, just, I just want to get, a, just to clarify, just, just wanted to get a confirmation of that. So for instance, if you had Google or Coca-Cola or whomever, you would not have, would you have you're saying that you would not have a trademark that could be a name also. It could be letters or what have you. Um, what, what I will answer to that and, and others can also chime in is that we have agreed that in this, we are not utilizing special characters. So um, so the the TM, other, other marks like that that might be typically utilized would not be the case here. It, it really would stay in a very standard format. So if you had a Coca-Cola or a Google, they would have to utilize the corporate name without a mark put to it. Okay. In, in the standard fonts, you know, there's a there's a specified font, so everything will be in the same font, not the distinctive logo. If there were a corporation that wanted to buy in at this individual targeted level, okay. be a little, you know. Uh, thank them. you. So along those lines, also, I think you. My understanding is that there are three font sizes, from what I can tell, um, or three you know sizes depending on the level of donation. If you happen to have a, an exceptionally large donation or a corporation uh, involved, with, is there is an accommodation for a larger font size for those, or are you uh, strictly adhering to this notion that there will only be three font sizes? There will be three um, for our walkway. We actually have an interior donor wall that we're utilizing for larger donations. So donations that are coming to us that are at the, the 250 or larger mark will be on the interior of the building, not the exterior. So this really is made as a way for us to open this to donors who may not typically engage with us or have an opportunity to come in at a level um, that that they could actually that that's palatable for for people. So um, so this is a little different approach for us. So really going back to your point, which I, I think is a great question, you're probably going to see the majority of corporate names on the interior of the building because that's where we usually get those larger gifts. Um, and, and so we have a donor wall inside. OK, great. And uh, uh, next question, um, uh, could you speak, uh, could one of you speak a little bit about just your naming convention process you have in place? I'm thinking it, 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 certainly nowadays with, um, with uh, the controversy around certain statutes and certain uh, naming of buildings and what have you, uh, I think there's a, a greater level of sensitivity 
in, in that respect. Could you speak to what sort of vetting process uh, within the naming conventions you have, what vetting process you have to, to minimize uh, what I would call the reputational risks that you may, mm -hmm. uh, in theory, that you are exposed to by doing this? Sherry, I don't know if you want to answer to that or if you want me to take that. Yes, so so this is one of the things we've been obviously concerned about and have had discussions about it. And I think that it is, um, we haven't come up with, maybe you've got some good suggestions, anything that is completely full, foolproof. We, truthfully, with the donor walk itself, we are expecting most of the people who will uh, participate in this to be our, our uh, students, faculty, staff, they will be people that we know. And so I think we are hoping that that will give us a little bit of uh, security and confidence in terms of the names that are there. But when, when in our planning group, when this discussion or this question and issue came up, one of the things that we believe that we would do were we to find, we have a name there that we can no longer um, hold to or, or keep in the walk, that we would have to replace a paver. We would take it out, remove the name, put in a new paver, re-engrave. That's what the institution would have to do. Because you know you can't erase a name after it's been engraved um, individually. So that's that's sort of where we are, but uh, clearly we can learn more about this. Uh, this is this is something we need to take seriously and to prepare for. Yeah, I, I, I'm just speaking for myself right now, not the committee. I haven't had any discussions with anybody else on the committee about what I'm about to say, but I have been involved uh, uh, in in other organizations, corporations, and nonprofits, um, where it's useful to set up some sort of a reputational risk um, process, a committee um, uh, with a range of, um, of uh, backgrounds on it um, who can uh, vet these because it's, I've, I've been involved in a couple of situations where uh, names just sort of fall through the cracks or decisions fall, reputation, decisions that carry reputational risk just so, sort of fall through the cracks and it's better to have a process up front. You can always play around with it and change it, but to have a, a routine process so that so that all your decisions are vetted through that, that at least will minimize um, the risk you're taking in this, this area. And I think a lot of people have a tendency to underestimate the potential risk they could be taking. In the, I think that's very good advice and, and we will definitely take it to heart. Okay, um, Craig. That's that's all I have on my end. Thank you, John. Uh, Kim. Oh, sorry. I meant to put my hand down. John basically covered my question, also just around a gift acceptance policy, and yeah, definitely encourage you to consider that. And I also run a charity, so I have lots of experience in having to consider things like that. So. Uh, Mike, did you have your hand up? I saw your, I thought I saw your hand up before. It was up, and I, and I decided maybe I shouldn't, but I will because uh, I have no. Um, so um, if I didn't have 250, um, so I couldn't get my name inside and I wanted it outside, what would that run? We are actually working on that right now. So there, there are, we're taking this step by step. Um, being with you this evening is one of the big steps. Um, and so once we know a bit more about our go forward plan, we are looking at all of our costs, um, the positioning of this. This is, this is very different than what many campaigns are like out there, meaning that you all are probably very familiar with a brick campaign and those, those come at a very reduced cost. What we're trying to do is look at those three levels and really determine our costs right now. So I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I will assure you that we will get back to you and we'll even save a, a line on a, on a paper for you if you're interested. <laughs> Just one more. Uh, this is purely an academic, not a dorm. Absolutely. That's the big thing. It's, it's city owned property. Our dorms are not city owned property. Thank you. And the city does not pay to build them. 
Thank you, Mike. Uh, Todd. Hi there. Uh, I'm very familiar with this block. I've been up and down it a million times. It's been a construction zone, I guess, as you say, for the last several years. And I'm incredibly gratified to see that it's going to be nearing completion in the next two years. I'm looking now at the rendering of your academic building. It's going to be a credit to the block. And I think, uh, you know, quite honestly, a lot of the other arch architecture of FIT at times it was me cold. It was from another era. But if anything, this is an improvement on the old design. It brings some life and light compliment you on your use of glass. Uh, so altogether, it's a tremendous addition to the neighborhood. My only, and I, I basically, uh, I, I think that John's advice and comments uh, subsumed much of what I would have said. My only comment is having seen many applications uh, before or, or many hearings about sidewalks and distinctive sidewalks and often the use of sidewalks to have engraved names as a component of fundraising. I think I would be a mess if I didn't at least mention the fact that so many times when I'm walking down the block, whenever I see it, I'm very sensitive to it maybe because I've, I've been through so many of these hearings, but so many times uh, <clears throat> it's done and then over the years, it's not maintained. Uh, you have cracks, the engravings fill in with dirt and you can barely see it. And it becomes an afterthought or it becomes something that I think that the donors would not be particularly enthusiastic about. And just as somebody in the general public that's walking down the street, you know, they might look at it, not even be able to read the names. So since, it's part of the aesthetic, what plans or accommodations are being made to maintain the, engra the engravings over time? Is that something that you're concerned about and planning for? Emily, could you talk about the durability of the engraving and the pavers? And then, you know, maintenance is something that happens all over the college all, every year. But Emily, would you address the specificity of the granite and the carvings? Sure. So the pavers themselves are are quite durable. As as Lisa said earlier, this is not like a, a brick campaign. These are very large, um, very substantial granite pavers, which is an incredibly durable stone. The slab is another might be a more slab. evocative yeah. word. So that, that largest paver size. An idea is four feet long by a foot and a half deep. So these are very large slabs. Um, and that heft really helps protect it against cracking. So with or without the names, um, these are stones that should not be seeing cracks or chips. Um, the, the names or the lettering themselves, we, we tested several samples to make sure that we were getting a legibility that felt really good to everyone. And that's where that infill with the black um, the black treatment came in to make the names really pop out. That being said, um, the material that's used to give that black coating does need some, perhaps some slight retouching where foot, tra foot traffic is heaviest. That might need to happen on something like a five-year schedule. And that's something that we've discussed with FIT throughout the design process. Um, it's, and we've discussed that with um, the stone supplier and manufacturer as well. And that's a product and a skill set that really everyone felt any maintenance team can learn to do and execute those touch ups on an as needed basis. So um, I'm not sure someone from FIT wants to speak more about their kind of maintenance protocol, um, but it, it felt plus like something that was very achievable to be a maintainable um, feature far into the future. So, so Lisa, if it's okay, let me just say a, a word about the maintenance protocols. I think the, the that question, uh, Mr. Shapiro, is is 
very near and dear to my heart. And I think to many of us at FIT, because we're very aware we're going to have this spectacular brand new building. And, uh, but it will age, uh, you know, like all of our buildings do and like all of us sadly do as well. Um, but um, one of the things we, one of the reasons that the donor campaign is important is not only to give people an opportunity to put their fingerprint or their name and associate it with this construction at FIT, but also to raise funds for a um, an endowment for the building that will keep it um, well maintained. We want to make sure that in our classrooms that the um, that you know all of the technology is upgraded and that things do not become old and worn and um, not something that we can be proud of. And the donor walk will absolutely have to be part of that. Um, it should, you know, particularly because we are raising funds uh, associated with that walk, we need to make sure that we do that uh, as recommended by uh, Emily and her team, that five-year maintenance protocol, and that we learn to do the touch-ups so that the, the donors will always uh, have been proud of having put their name on this walk. Any other questions, Todd? I hope I'm good with that. Good luck with it. And I hope that it's maintained properly over the years. Any other questions from the committee? Any questions from members of the public? We still have some uh, members of the public. Uh, it's Todd, Todd you're, you're, I'm gonna lower your hand. Is that, is that okay? Or do you have anything else? Okay, you can lower it down. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the committee? Todd, uh, John, do you wanna make a motion? Yes, um, I make a motion uh, to, uh, um, to approve the amendments to uh, the two previous applications that were before CB5. So to um, to change the granite um, uh, uh, and the color and tone of the granite and number two, uh, to permit uh, engraving um, as described uh, by the applicant. Second. In the papers. Okay, I hear a second. Uh, Kim, you wanna take it to a vote? Fantastic. Slutskin? Yes. McCall, yes. Achilles? Yes. Berman? Yes. Blake? Yes. Ellington? Yes. Ford? Yes. Harris? Yes. Payback? Yes. King? Yes. Shapiro? Yes. Spandor? Yes. Spence? Yes. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone uh, from FIT. Thank you, Lisa. We will get you uh, our, resolu our resolution. It, obviously, it'll be uh, viewed or uh, considered by the full board at the full board meeting. I believe that's next Thursday. We'll be there. I'm sure how would you like? Would you like us to to just what? How would you like us to do the two minutes at the full board? I mean, are you probably going to bundle this, right? It'll be it'll be bundled. It's up to I, you know. I leave it up to you, Lisa. If you want to spend a few seconds on this and then talk about your usual schedule. If, if you you're going to bundle it, I think we'll just skip the whole historic introduction part and just say this is what it looks like, and it's going to be beautiful. And then I can tell you about our very exciting. Uh, Fresh Fly Fabulous Hip Hop Exhibition that's celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop that's opening on February 7th. Great, we're looking forward to it. Looking forward to hearing about it. Thank you, everybody. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. And then uh, our next item is the Visit Orlando Activation at Bryant Park. Uh, uh, let's see who's gonna present for Bryant Park. I thought I saw. Kelly on before. I'm here. Yeah. Oh, there you are. There you are. Sorry. From Hi. Black House, um, Cassandra and Elizabeth are on the line as well. Okay. I know you, uh, Daniel, went through this, but I'm going to let you uh, start the presentation. Tell us about the event. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. My name is Cassandra. I am uh, one of the co-founders at Black House, and um, I can share my screen. Just one second. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, we have the pleasure of working with Visit Orlando and the Bryant Park team for this really fun community-based uh, activation we have on February 18th. Um, so Black House, we are a women and minority-owned production company based here in New York City. Um, and we have um, experience working at Bryant Park. We had the pleasure of working at Paramount um, most recently uh, this past summer at the um, the mountain of movies activations we did with them so very excited to be back this winter with visit orlando so the event is slated to take place on saturday february 18th it will be from 12 p.m until 8 p.m um so just a little bit about visit orlando they are the official tourism association for orlando they are a not-for-profit and they are already actively um working with the park through the uh winter series so this is uh, basically a special day to amplify um, their presence existing already. Um, so the event is gauged, um, is slated to really bring awareness to Orlando. And um, what better way than being outside in New York City in the summer day, uh, in the winter time to remind us how nice Orlando is. Um, the activation will have brand ambassadors sitting uh, spread out around the different activation areas um, that basically be capturing pictures that people can share um, and giving out some free hot cocoa and some free swag. Um, so before I get into what this looks like, just some of the statistics and logistics. Um, so we are setting up in the morning, starting um, serving hot chocolate and, you know, giving out our free gifts to the public from 12 on till 8 and um the event ends at 8 will be out of the park by 10. um we're expecting about 600 we use this number based off um, our experience um doing similar activations and working with the park on the um the current estimates of how many people are, are attending um using the um the ice skating rink and so forth um so We'll have about 10 staff working at the event. Um, it is 100% free. There's no cash exchange, nothing is sold. Um, so for food and beverage, we're giving out hot cocoa with all the fixings. And it's actually served with a partnership with one of the existing vendors, rather than bringing in free giveaways um, that were competing with the existing vendors. Um, the park team um, introduced us and brokered a relationship with Joe's Coffee, who actually has a kiosk or, or, or vendor area, vending area in the park selling hot chocolate. So we were able to partner with the existing and help that small business amplify on, uh, on their sales that day. Um, so that hot cocoa is all we're giving out um, for food and beverage. We also are giving out sunglasses and scarves. Um, there is no AV, there's no sound, there's no audio, um, no no noise, um, no video equipment. We do have uh, wireless lights that we'll be using for the last couple hours of just in particular for the, um, the photo activation area. And as far as sanitation, um, we are including additional trash bins that we will be responsible for clearing throughout the day. Um, and those are noted on our layout. Um, so just a little bit about the photo moment. Um, it is one snow globe. I have a couple pictures here, but just underlying it is one snow globe. And inside of it is um, featuring this Orlando graphic in the top left. Um, and we have some beach balls and, and things like that inside for um, just for fun, for taking the photo. Um, the photos being shared are 100% digital. There's no printed photos being given out. It's just um, free digital digital photos that they'll receive. Um, we do have a live photographer. It's not one of those you know booths where people are just entering things in. It's an actual photographer that is positioned outside of the globe. Um, this is the cart that we'll be serving our hot chocolate from, and the um, cups uh, that our learned team has. Um, just made these branded Visit Orlando cups. Um, they'll have some, you know, fixings and so forth. Um, we do have non-dairy options uh, and um, yeah, so different syrups and um, fun glow-in-the-dark marshmallows. Um, for our footprint, um, so 
this yellow area is essentially our footprint um, for the activation. Uh, on here, this large white circle is the snow globe. Um, and just for context of where this lands in the park, on the right-hand side here, this is the carousel. So our um, we are setting back enough space. Um, so these are stanchions here. So there's plenty of space here to maintain access to the ticket booth to get into the carousel. Um, our photographer will be about here, um, positioned so to be able to take pictures. The context of the, the composition of the photo is the full globe. So the photographer set back. So that's why there's so much open space here. This is um, necessary for them to be able to set back to get that picture. Um, if it's a beautiful sunny day, um, we won't necessarily need these tents, but we do have tents um, to cover the table and beverage cart um, should we have any kind of weather. Um, on here, we've noted that the trash cans, these are additional trash cans that we're bringing in um, separate from what's already existing in this area in the park. Um, the queue line here on the left, this is showing the exit here. Um, so we have uh, a clear entry and exit. Um, we'll have, you can see the people, the shadows of people standing around. We have, I said, uh, about 10 staff on site. So there'll be plenty for helping ensure um, we're maintaining the certain setbacks and 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 space for, for the general public to be getting by, not like um, creating any kind of bottleneck with the line of, lines. Um, last thing on here to point out is the signage. So that's these yellow stars. So these signs are actually floor standing signs. They're, they're not very large. They're about 14 inches, um, 14 inches wide, but I think 17 high. So um, not full poster size, but bigger than an eight and a half by 11 paper. Um, and these are just, um, again, floor standing signs, nothing that's being attached to anything. Um, we bring those signs in ourselves. Um, I think that is uh, all that I had to share. So I guess I'll open up for questions. Can you talk about your social media presence and what you are doing to ensure that park goers who wish to be in the park that day um, don't get caught up and you know put on camera that they don't want to be on camera or alternatively aren't you know allowed in certain areas of the of the park because if they do they're they run the risk of, of being in the background or have their photo taken. Talk, talk about that, releases, things like, things like that. Okay. Yeah, our photography is limited to only those that get inside the globe. So if you have not come over and stepped into the globe for your own photo moment on your own choice, then you're not in any of our photos. So there's no Instagram, social media, recording, Twitter, whatever. There's none of that. We do not have a photographer that's going around taking candid shots. We just have the photographer that is taking pictures at the snow globe. Okay. Uh, Mike. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the, the uh, area is just to the west of the carousel from the diagram. I'm reading it right. And it's enclosed. I'd like to know how it's enclosed because there's an exit which means that you're keeping people out, letting them in over there. Tell me something about the enclosure, number one. And number two, you're expecting 600 people. That's kind of a small area. How many do you anticipate inside the globe and outside, uh, inside the area and outside the area at the same time? So I have for now. Um, so... The 600 is an estimate of people that would come through over the course of eight hours. Um, so I will say that with the 600 people, that's really what we're basing on. Um, that's how many servings of hot cocoa we have. How many people actually get in the snow globe for po for photos? I imagine would be dramatically less. I think that um, in my experience in the park, people come over for the, for the free snack and don't necessarily stay for the photos all the time unless they're compelled to and they think it looks fun. Um, so less than 600 people actually getting in the globe. Um, as far as people getting in the globe, so we do have um, 
In addition to the photography team, we have brand ambassadors that would be assisting. I imagine it's going to be more families and group pictures. So it would take a few minutes. It's not something like, you know, step and repeat where you take a quick picture and keep it moving. It's more of a like get in, get comfortable, you know, you're with your family. So I imagine that whole experience would probably take like three minutes or so for each um, for each photo. Um, because it is more of a physical getting in and out. So not as many people participating in that. Um, as far as the exits and the entrance, um, so uh, Kelly, I forgive me, can you help me? I, I remember we talked about yeah. barricades because so we're not going to use them. Correct. So this area isn't enclosed. I know what the, the layout seems like it, uh, mm -hmm. but this is just the designated gravel area like to your point that's just to the left of the of the carousel so the only portion of this that's going to be kind of barricaded would be that area of stanchions between where the snow globe is and where the ticket booth is so that's to ensure that ticket uh that the ticket booth for the carousel and guests who are choosing to go into the carousel have a designated area where they can purchase their tickets they also have their stroller parking same as usual and that there's just like a little bit more um, separation between the two otherwise uh there actually isn't any other enclosures their brand ambassadors will be um helping to to manage the flow of traffic in and out of the activation area. But you mentioned the um, uh, there's an entrance mm -hmm. and an exit just at one location over there on the west side. Uh, what why what's enclosing the area so people can't walk in where uh, in any of the other parts of the perimeter. It's not that it's enclosed. It's more just for waiting for your turn for the for the queue lines where it says enter. Um, we'll have staff around. I mean, that would um, help, you know, protect the perimeter, so to speak. But it is more of a casual activation. And the, the queue lines where it says enter and enter, it really is to be in line to receive your free snacks and gifts or to take your picture if somebody walked in and started checking things out with the snow globe you know and say they walked behind the photographer it wouldn't be a detrimental thing um I, the brand ambassador would probably politely walk up and be like hey would you like to get in line for your turn the queue line starts over here um but it's um to kelly's point not enclosed so it is open very um more casual thank you cool. any other questions from the committee Uh, Daniel, you review this. Do you want to comment on this or do you have any questions on this? Um, yeah, I'll make a few comments. Um, thanks y'all for the presentation. Um, I appreciate there are some extra points and details in here you included um, that it was nice to see, particularly about sanitation. Uh, I know that was something we were looking at. Um, I also encourage you to use recycling if possible. Um, I appreciate that you talked about measurements for the signs. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I can, I put it through the matrix. I'll say it definitely tilts because of its um, small footprint, short time, no sound, kind of heavily on the desirable side. Um, so I think, you know, under under that, it's worth approving. I would say, I know this is not within the current purview of the board. Personally, um, you know, I'm going to find it hard to support advertising for a state that is actively discriminating against me. So, if that's the board, we want to consider that in the future. Um, I would encourage us to think about perhaps putting on the matrix something about values or things like that. Um, but for now, uh, I think that's all I will say here. And this seemed fine to us. Um, let me th thank you, Daniel. Um, let sorry, did I cut you off or are you did you conclude yours? Okay, I didn't want to cut you off. Sorry. Um, let me ask the members of the public that are on, on now. We still have uh, members of the public if they have any questions. And uh, Charles, uh, I'm going to unmute you. You should be okay to go. 
Hi, can you hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly. Thank you, Charles. Oh, you. thank you. Um, thank you. So I was wondering, I was a little bit confused. Um, I think it was said this event is 100% free. I was just wondering why tickets need to be purchased for the carousel. And um, if they, since they have to be purchased, um, what is the method? Is it through a website or an app? And would that website or app be accessible to, for example, Siri or uh, voiceover on the iPhone? And I also wanted to know um, how long is the ride on the uh, carousel? And for me, people will be on the carousel one time. Thank you. Hi, Charles. Um, there's a whole team at Bryant Park that actually works on the carousel. I'd be happy to connect you with them. Um, the carousel won't be a part of the activation. The activation is actually just next door to the carousel. Um, I'm happy to get that information for you, though. Um, I don't have it handy with me because I'm fairly new to the Bryant Park team. Um, but I will say that the tickets, I believe, can only be bought at the ticket booth, so on site at the park. Um, but again, I can pull some more information for you on that part, uh, that wonderful amenity of the park, if you'd like. Thank you. And um, sorry for the misunderstanding. And I'm also very grateful to the good work that you guys at Bryant Park do for me. I think um, uh, Zach helps me a lot from the um, Bryant Park team also. So thank you very much. Zach's a great team member and a great friend. So I'm really glad that you've had a great experience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles, for your, for your comments on this and, and all other applications as well, of course. Uh, I think David, you, uh, sorry, before we go to David, are there uh, any other comments from the public? Sorry, I didn't wanna not allow others to speak. Okay, uh, we'll, come, we'll go into the business section. David, did you wanna speak or do you have comments? Yeah, you know, one brief thing. I agree completely with what Daniel said. The presentation is great. In the old days, they pretty much covered everything we would have gone over. I do wonder if it might be appropriate to add one line, one sentence in the resolution about what Daniel brought up about the state of Florida. If it's appropriate, maybe we should do it. If it's inappropriate, let's just pass the, you know, just put it up for a vote. We generally do not get into uh, that level of politics and political views because it does become Democrat, Republican, that kind, that kind of stuff. I do under, I do hear um, the concerns of Daniel and, and now David as well. I do hear that. We generally don't put those in uh, because that opens up. Yeah, I get it. You know, that opens up a door that 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 you know we can go through every application and. Someone's gonna find. Someone may find something offensive, and I'm not discounting Daniel's point. I totally get it, and I hear it. Uh, we generally don't get into the political views of, you know, uh, political views on on things like that. You know, we do it when we talked about you know city services, and we have had resolutions at the board of the fund, the police, that that kind of stuff. But uh, we generally don't get involved. Don't don't comment on the political views of clients of Brian Park, you know. Right, thank you. Other comments? Okay, uh, and, and just so you know, feel free to make those comments at full board as well. I mean, that's you, as is your right, you know, you should feel free to make any comments that you you wish for the record uh, and for other people to hear, for the, full, for the full board to hear at full board, so. Uh, so I would just say a giant snow cone in one of our parks. This falls well within the range of the unusual and sometimes garish exhibits that we've seen. So since we've accepted those, as long as they don't get too big and too outlandish, I guess we can vote to accept this one. <laughs> And there's no social media issue of people. Yes, uh, no social media. Thank you. Of, uh, of disclaimers. Uh, so, David, do you, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Daniel, do you want to make a motion? Or does somebody else want to make a motion? Yeah, motion to approve. Second. Second to vote. Great. Sorry, I keep, I keep ending up on mute. I'll get this right one of these days. Okay. Slutskin? Yes. 
McCall, yes. Achilles? Yes. Berman? Yes. Blake? Yes. Ellington? Yes. Ford? Yes. Harris? Yes. Kayback? Yes. King? Yes. Shapiro? Yes. Spandorf? Yes. And Spence? Yes. Great. Motion passes. Thank you. And uh, good luck with the event. Let us know how it goes. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank much. you for your time. Thank Have you. Have a great, great night, all. And um, so I guess John and Daniel, if you can do the resos for those two applications, I'll take care of the uh, the, the Madison Square Park one. Um, are there any items of new business, either by the committee or by the public? Seeing none, uh, then I guess this meeting is adjourned. Thank you again for everyone and their your participation. It's always great to hear from all of you, and 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 your participation is very much valued by uh, the executive committee. So thank you very much, and I will see you all at full board. Meeting is adjourned.